All right, Colossians for, be, uh, for beginners. This is lesson number 10 in the series. We'll be at Colossians chapter three, beginning in verse uh, 18, if you're following along in your, uh, if you're on, in your own Bibles. Uh, and we're nearing the end of this series, just a couple of more classes to go. So far we've learned that this letter was written to uh, reject a system of false teaching and teachers who were attempting to displace Jesus and His teachings as the primary standard for Christian life and doctrine. Pretty much summarizes what has been taking place in this letter in the last uh, several lessons. So after Paul describes Christ's priority or His preeminent position in the scheme of things, he then goes on uh, to explain that Jesus' teachings have an equal priority. So if Jesus has the priority, if He's preeminent in heaven and on earth, head of the church, so on and so forth, then what He teaches you know, has priority as well. Now He also describes for them the type of life that is supposed to emanate from these teachings. Uh, as I say, uh, Christ is preeminent uh, in all things, well, he's preeminent in ethics as well. In other words, how one should live. So last time I described the standard for Christian life that is established by Jesus' teachings and the, the details or the elements of that standard that pertains to us as Christians. So basically, and this is just a, a summary here, uh, we said that the Christian standard, the elements of the Christian standard of living uh, involve holiness, for example, and as Paul explained it, uh, especially uh, sexual purity, uh, involves a loving nature, uh, being truthful and uh, with, uh, with others, uh, speaking the truth in love, so to speak, uh, having a thankful heart, uh, a life that is motivated by a grateful spirit and expressed in worship and uh, praise. In our lesson today, Paul is going to add another element in this Christian standard that makes up the, the ethic or the standard of life that Christ uh, gives us according to His uh, teachings, and that is an ordered family. So holiness, a loving nature, a thankful heart, an ordered family. Now, most of our lives are lived within the context of a family, so it would only be natural for Jesus to include instructions for family life so that we would have these teachings as a basis for marriage and for uh, developing and maintaining uh, a family. Now you have to understand the Judaizers, in many instances, they forbade marriage and they saw marriage as a concession to the flesh. The pagans, on the other hand, they had a very loose commitment to the marriage bond and they modeled it after the ignorant and cruel system that they themselves came, uh, came from. You know, men treated their wives and their children as property. Women and children survived as best they could through cleverness and silent submission. And so Paul establishes the basis for an orderly family according to the words of Christ, not according to the Judaizers, not according to the standards that existed in those days, but a st uh, the standard according to what Christ was teaching. So we go to chapter three, verse 18. He begins and says, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting, um, as is fitting in the Lord. So he begins with the wives. Wives should be in submission to their husbands. Again, the word used here is the same as the one used by Paul in Ephesians 5.21, where he says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Same word. In Ephesians, he referred to Christians in the church who were to be subject in submission to one another. In Colossians, it's the wife to be in submission uh, to her husband. Uh, the Greek word is a military term, which means to place oneself under. The idea that a soldier understands his rank and recognizes and submits to the one who has a higher rank than, than he or she does. Well, in the marriage relationship, the ranks, if you wish, were handed out by God in Genesis, and they haven't changed. You know, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, it says, your, he says, God says to the woman, he said, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now the requirement that there be only one man and one woman for life 
in a marriage was established here in Genesis and it was confirmed by Jesus in Matthew 19, 4, 5, and 6. And it was taught by Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verse 1 and the following. Now the reason I say this is, is, is this. Everybody agrees that this is the ideal marriage arrangement, right? When we're defending you know, the sanctity of marriage, we always say, well, in Genesis it says, you know, one man, one woman for life. That's, you know, that's the basis of marriage. You know, it's not two men together, or two women together. It's not three men and one woman. You know, it's not that, it's one man and one woman. And we've got, we've got scripture to prove that. We, that's the basis. And you know, we all agree, yeah. But do we also realize that in the very same scripture, <laughs> the very same place, where God is establishing the elements of marriage, He also says that the man shall rule over his wife, that the wife will be in submission to her husband. It's the same, same passage. You, you can't accept one and reject the other. You can't say, oh well, he really meant that. <laughs> one man, one woman for life. He really meant that, but he, he wasn't serious about the other part, the role of man, the role of woman in marriage. Don't forget, this is after the fall, not before the fall. Before the fall, men and women were together, co-inheritors, right? Co-rulers of the, of, the, uh, of the creation, right? It's after sin that God imposed uh, this uh, arrangement. Well, in the same way, as I said, the requirement that a wife be subject to her husband was also established in Genesis and confirmed and taught by Paul in the New Testament, not only in this passage, but also in Ephesians 5.22 as well. Now, Jesus doesn't ever say this particular thing. He doesn't you know, elaborate on this. But Paul, in teaching this, says that it is fitting or proper in the Lord that a wife submit to her husband. You notice he says, as is fitting in the Lord. What does that mean? What's he talking about? Well, he's saying the Lord. I'm agreeing with the Lord. This is fitting according to the Lord's teachings. This is, this is a fitting thing. So this is an easy one to understand, but not such an easy one to accomplish for a variety of reasons. For example, the husband may not be a Christian. Well, <laughs> not easy being in submission to a husband who's not a Christian. Or the husband is a weak or immature Christian. That also isn't easy for a woman to be in submission, you know, a, a, a faithful, knowledgeable Christian woman to be in subjection to a weak, uh, you know, disobedient Christian man. Or the wife has a forceful personality in opposition to her husband. She's the strong one. She's the one that's the great organizer. She's the one that gets things done. You know, I mean, those qualities are not necessarily relegated just to men. You know, we have women who are CEOs of world-class corporations and quite successful. So to be well organized, to be a leader, so on and so forth, those are not necessarily gifts that have only been given to men. They've been equally given to men and women. And of course, problems in a dysfunctional family. Husband's an alcoholic or something like that. You know. An abuser of some kind. So you know, it's easy to say, not always easy to accomplish. So whatever the situation, women need to understand several things about this particular teaching, that wives should be in subjection to their husbands. A couple of things we need to remember about that. First, this is not a cultural thing. This teaching is not an outdated Jewish thing that we should ignore because it doesn't fit into our society anymore. It's a command of God and it is relevant in every generation. Every generation has to deal with this teaching. In marriage, what God wants, what is proper, what is the right thing for Christians is that wives be in submission to their husbands. That's the ideal. Now you can teach this idea to your children because it'll be around as long as marriage will be around. Secondly, this teaching, it's not an absolute thing. Although the Bible says this is what would be proper for those calling themselves Christian women, 
it doesn't mean that it's always possible. See what I'm saying? For example, a, a woman who's a widow, she can't do this. <laughs> a widow can't be in submission. You know, her husband's gone, she's alone. A divorced woman cannot do this. You know, in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, Paul says, you know, if the unbelieving spouse leaves, let him go. You're not bound. What does that mean? You're not bound. You're not tied to him anymore. And so a divorced woman is really divorced. <coughs> that man that is no longer her husband. She cannot be in submission to him. Or a woman whose husband is evil, cruel, violent. She can't do this. She risks her life in doing this. If she's being abused, if, if, in, my, in my ministry career, women who have come to me because their husbands are abusers, you know, violent abusers, you know, <laughs> number one priority, safety. Get yourself to a safe place. You know, I've said this before, as Christians, you know, we're not relegated to being punching bags or doormats. That's, we're allowed to use the law to protect ourselves against those who wish to abuse us and harm us. Or a woman whose husband is mentally ill or incapable of making decisions for whatever reason, she can't do this either. So it's not, you know, it's not an absolute thing. There are exceptions, valid exceptions. However, for those who are trying to have a marriage that is, as Paul says, fitting in the Lord, the woman should be in subjection to her husband. Do this thing, Paul says, if it's possible. But if you don't do it or you use a different system because it suits your personality better, well then your relationship, you're still married. It's just not, quote, fitting in the Lord. You're doing it your way. You're not doing the Lord's way. And then thirdly, it's, it's something you choose. It's a choice. If you're beaten or threatened into submission, this is not submission, this is slavery, this is abuse, this is wrong. Submission is a choice that the wife makes for the greater good of the family, not as an act of debasement. God never orders us to do debasing things. Submission actually is a faith issue. It really is all about faith. It's not a competency issue. Both partners in the marriage are equally competent, maybe skilled in different areas, but equally competent, equally valuable in the eyes of God. This is a faith issue. A Christian woman gives freely because of her faith the leadership role in the marriage to her husband and in addition to that, she reinforces that decision every day by respecting him. That's true submission. It's a gift. Because, the woman said, because I believe, I'm giving you this gift to be the moral and spiritual leader of our home. And I will support you. And I will pray for you. And I will encourage you in this role. Why? because it is fitting in the Lord. It's the right thing to do. It's the way God wants us to do this thing. Verse 19, he says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Now you have to understand, in a world where marriages were arranged by parents, in a world where women were treated as property many times, it was natural for Paul to admonish men to love and not to treat their, har their wives harshly. You know, when you view your wife, when your view of your wife is that she's property, it's very difficult to love her as yourself or treat her as you would want to be treated. You know? Note that Paul's instructions for men don't have much to do with being good leaders or fair managers. It would, also, it would almost seem, you know, if he says to the woman, be in submission to your husband, you know, he would then say, okay, now you husbands, you better be good leaders now. You better be good managers. You better take care of business. You know. Not a word, nothing, zip, about that facet. He goes to the heart is what is difficult for men. Love and tenderness. 
you know, we've come a long way as a society, but the commands for men remain the same within marriage. There to, what does he say? Love their wives. Now in another kind of passage where he talks about this in Ephesians 5.22, he gives more details about this love. He says that this love is to be similar to the love that Christ has for the church. Well, what kind of love does Christ have for the church? Well, he has sacrificial love. The willingness to give himself for the church. And Paul in Ephesians saying the husband should be willing to give himself for his, for his wife. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the woman has to be willing to you know, give up her life for her husband. But it does say the husband should be willing to give up his life for his wife. And that it is the love is to be similar to the love they have for themselves. Men are to love their wives like they love themselves, being generous because we're always generous with ourselves, aren't we? Again, this command for a husband's love remains until there will be no need for marriage. Of course, that'll be heaven. I often say, a woman who is loved in this way finds it a joy to respect and submit to her husband. Why, why wouldn't she? She knows that her husband is not only ready to give his life for her, but does pour his life out for her and for the family. He does the heavy lifting. And I don't just mean the heavy lifting, you know, I'll, I'll fix the car and I'll mow the lawn. I mean the heavy lifting, the emotional heavy lifting. He's the one that'll do the sacrificing. He's ready to do that. And then he says, to be tender towards them. Well, you know, he says not to be bitter towards them, the opposite meaning to be tender. The term bitter means sharp, pointed, harsh. When you perceive something as less than you are, it's easy to disrespect it. It's easy to become harsh and cruel. Why do you think we kick cats? <laughs> you know? Why do you think we smack dogs? We love them most of the time, but when they get on our nerves, get out of here, you know, it's a dog. It's less than we are, it's an animal. Imagine, there are times we treat our wives like we treat dogs. Think about that. So Paul's admonishment requires men to keep in mind who is this person, who is the wife? Well, the Bible says she is a gift from God, Proverbs 18, 22. Genesis 2, 24 says she's a partner for life. Genesis 4, 1, a mother for his children, their children. I don't know about you men, but I've, I've, been, I've assisted at all of Lisa's uh, delivery, births. And you know, I mean, 30, plus years ago, that wasn't exactly the thing to do. Now it's the thing to do. You know, it's, it's in vogue now. You know, husbands are right there. My fa in my father's day, you know, the men waited out in the waiting room, right? And they smoked. <laughs> you know, and they just waited. And in my generation, it's just, it began to be the thing that men went in and they, they were with their wives. Still in the hospital, it was still, everything was done in a quote operating room, not like today. And I want to tell you, I, I sat there and, well, I didn't sit, but I was there and I was watching what she went through four times in five years. <laughs> if I, I said to her once after the, the last one was born, I said, man, if I ever leave you, God will strike me dead, dead, dead <laughs> after everything you've been through to put these children into life. I mean, not just the carrying and the pain of childbirth, but you know, the nursing them, and oh my goodness, the toll on her body. The toll on her body. Wow. Yeah, they're never the same after your wives, after they've had children. I'm not saying they're worse, I'm just saying they're never the same. There's a reason <laughs> they're never the same. So such a precious person 
must be treated with care and with tenderness. Now I would say the same thing to men as I did to the women on this subject. A man must choose to be this way with his wife. Why? It doesn't come naturally. Of course I love you, didn't I tell you? I told you at Christmas I love you, come on. It doesn't come naturally for a woman to submit to her husband. She has to choose and cultivate a submissive nature through prayer and through practice, through study. Well, in the same way, it doesn't come naturally for a man to love his wife sacrificially and tenderly. It is natural to act this way because of desire. Yeah, all warm and tender, because I want you. But it isn't natural to just be this way. Men are just more naturally selfish than women. And I have a feeling the reason for that is they don't give birth to children. So in the end, the man must choose to deny himself and make his wife the beneficiary of his love and tenderness rather than himself. Because men tend to love themselves very easily. So I hear women say, well, it's not easy being in submission to, to a man, you know, especially a sinful man. You know? And my answer to the women, yeah, well, you know what? It's not easy for a man to love his wife sacrificially and tenderly. It doesn't come naturally. He has to work at it. He has to choose to do that. He has to deny himself. Can we go on? Verse 20, 21. He says, children. Remember what we're talking about here, just in case you know, we've lost the thread. You know, Paul is establishing the elements, the standards, you know, the standard of Christian life has certain elements and one of the elements of Christian living is an ordered family. And in an ordered family, wives in submission to husbands, husbands love their wives sacrificially, tenderly. Now he goes to the children, chapter three, verse 20, 21. It says, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Again, Paul reaches back to the elemental principles found in the Old Testament. In Exodus 20, verse 12, it says, Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord gives you. One of the commandments. So Paul summarizes this in Colossians by keeping the main elements and applying them in a New Testament context and that is the responsibility of children. Responsibility of the wife, responsibility of the husband, now the responsibility of the children. So obedience, obedience to parents, notice, in all things, in all things. This includes the commands of God and the daily judgments and the application of these in daily living made by the parents because the parents are applying these things on a day-to-day -day basis to guide their children. So when parents say, why? Because I said so, that's why. That's a legit thing. That's a legit thing for a parent to say, no, you'll do this because I say you have to do this. Oh yeah? Where does it say that in the Bible? Uh, yeah, uh, Colossians 3, 20, 21. <laughs> See, if you come back with that, that's it. Game is over right there. Set, point, match, we're done. Because Paul says, obey your parents in all things. But dad, the curfew, 10 o'clock, you got to be kidding. You know, 10 o'clock, Mary, she's allowed to be out until midnight and the other kids just come home whenever. Too bad, so sad. Curfew, 10 o'clock, but it's not fair. Yeah, oh well. But it is the law. It's the parents' law. Yeah, you don't go out at night during the week. You have to do your homework first. Oh, but dad, but it's the law. Where is it written in the Bible? Uh, Colossians 3, 20, 20. Anything that isn't sinful, anything that doesn't demand uh, disobeying God in some way or degrading oneself. Now the promise of the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus. And so now the children of God look forward to a heavenly promised land where, where Christ reigns. And so there's a blessing in learning to obey parents in all things. And what is the blessing? 
The blessing is that it prepares us to obey Christ and please Him. You know, we have all kinds of muscles in the body when there's also all kinds of emotional muscles and psychological muscles. And one of the psychological muscles is the obedience muscle. And parents are charged by the word to teach their children how to obey. Work that muscle. But why do I have to do that? Because mom says so. But dad, blah, blah, blah. No, no, if mom says so, then I say so. You're going to learn to obey. You're going to strengthen that muscle. Why? Because you want to learn the piano? You have to learn to obey the notes in your teachers. You want to learn how to play softball, baseball, hockey, whatever. You're going to have to obey the coach and do it the coach's way. You want to become a physicist, you want to become a doctor, a lawyer, a preacher, you want to be a, a farmer. You have, every trade, every practice requires obedience to the rules, to the methods, to the ways, to the instructions. If you want to be successful, you want to be a musician, you have to obey, you have to practice, practice. Where does that skill come from? Well, it comes from parents teaching their children to obey. Whatever, curfew 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 9 o'clock, that's not the point. The point is I have a thing there and I have to obey it. I have to kind of go against what I want to do and I have to do what my parents tell me to do. But there's a reward. And if parents do a bad job of this, the problem is then somebody else is going to teach Junior to obey. The school, the guard at the prison, the cruelty of society for someone who has no education, no skills, no willingness to pay attention, no ability to just do what they're told. So Paul here adds one caution to all of this obedience stuff. One caution, notice not to moms, but to dads. And that is not to overdo the authority thing. Now some Bibles use the term provoke to anger or to stir up emotionally. How do they do that? You know, it says, fathers do not exasperate your children so they'll not lose heart, you know, become so discouraged. How do fathers you know, how could they do that? Well, sometimes the goals are just too high. You got to be first, you got to win, you got to always place in the top three all the time. Excellence at all costs. Or being inconsistent. Sometimes curfews at 10, sometimes curfews at midnight, sometimes. <laughs> What's curfew this week? Sometimes it's just lack of praise and appreciation. A kid has to know, am I doing okay? Am I, you know, am I okay, dad? Are you proud of me? And you know, not every child is some sports superstar. You know how infinitesimal it is, the percentage of elite athletes in the world? They make it look like everybody should be like that. But there's a reason why these people receive millions and millions of dollars to throw balls and to hit balls and to run around and do stuff. You know, it's because so few people have their particular skill set. You know, let, let me clue you in here on the fact of life. Most everybody's just average. <laughs> Pretty much everybody's just average. You're average, I'm average, you know, I'm an average preacher, you're an average teacher, you're, you know, you're an average whatever you do, welder. You know. I mean, we're average. But we'd like to be exceptional. So if we're average, we want our children to be exceptional. Because if they're exceptional, it must mean somehow we're exceptional and nobody noticed. <laughs> Don't do that. And of course we cultivate that in our society. I don't want to go off on a rant here, you know, but I mean when everybody gets a trophy, when everybody gets a prize, you know, it's, 
it, it stokes this idea of, yeah, I'm, I'm so special. Or favoritism. Those of you who have more than one children know exactly what I'm talking about. There's always one child that thinks they're, they're the favorite or they're being favored over another child. In our family, everybody thought Emily was the favorite. They kept going. Well, she was, but I mean, <laughs> there are reasons for that. I never got any 3 a.m. calls for Emily. <laughs> but favoritism, it happens in families. You know? Sometimes a child is just easier, you know, more obedient you know, than perhaps the more self-willed child. That's just a challenge that parents, both parents, especially dads. You know, one of the greatest uh, uh, in my research in um, you know, same-sex attraction, homosexuality, stuff like that, while I was researching the book that I put out many years ago, one of the things that kept coming back all the time was one of the key factors that created an environment that, that made it more easily, uh, made it easier for someone to experience same-sex attraction, whether it was male or female, was the thing, it actually, <clears throat> excuse me, it actually had a name, it had a term, and it was called father hunger. Father hunger. getting the approval of father, having an intimate, non-sexual now, but an intimate relationship with father, like not having that, many men not having that would seek that out with other men. You know, fathers, eh, they don't hug, they don't touch, they don't kiss, you know. I kissed my father until the day he died. I mean, I was only 15, 16, but I would kiss him. Maybe we were Italian or whatever, but my son still kissed me. It's so important to have, for fathers, there, there was no such term for mother. There was no mother hunger. It was always father hunger for, 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 for males and females. Somehow if they didn't get that intimate father-son, father-daughter thing, they would seek it out or act out in a way that was self-destructive sexually. Now this class is not about that, but it's just so important. I can't, I can't emphasize this enough for you men out there who are fathers, who have children at home, how important that is. Grandfathers, how important it is. And then of course, creating jealousy by devoting too much time to work or hobbies. Children can be jealous. We, don't, we think only the wives are jealous because you know, you've got your bowling team. Well, I guess nobody bowls anymore, but you know what I'm saying. Football widows, golf widows, whatever. You know? And we kind of understand that idea. But children can be jealous also. Don't you think they notice that dad will choose a weekend, you know, weekend with the go-karts or the four-wheelers you know, with the buddies instead of weekend with, with him or her or them? I don't mean just once in a while, everybody has that, but you know what I'm saying, when consistently, when it's a choice between the kids or my hobby, it's always my hobby, always. It's every, every football game, it's every basketball game. Everyone, I don't miss those. I can miss Junior's baseball game. I can miss the time when Junior wants a story read. Don't you think Junior can hear the cheers of the crowd and Dad going, go, go, you, you know, don't you think he can hear that? When what he wanted was a kiss, good night, and a hug, and you know, so on and so forth, and it was just, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, 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 I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, bye, buddy, take care, buddy, uh, go, oh, you, you know, really? Ask yourself how much OU is going to comfort you when your kid's in trouble. Call the coach. See if the coach will come and comfort you because your child doesn't want to talk to you. Because the amount of interaction you have with them when they're small usually dictates how much interaction they'll have with you when they're grown up. It's a famous song by Harry Chapin that came out many years ago about that. So discouragement can easily lead 
to either depression or withdrawal or rebellion or acting out in a child. I mean, listen, I tell young parents, nothing creates more guilt than parenting. <laughs> you don't need the preacher to make you guilty. <laughs> you know, parents feel guilty because they want to do a good job. Most parents, they want to do a good job and they, they blame themselves for everything. Well, not everything is your fault. Children make choices too. But some of it is our fault. Some of it is. And it's never too late to change it. So the fourth element of the Christian standard is an orderly family. An orderly family is a tremendous witness of Christian grace and the presence of God in your life. Listen, people, you know, they don't see you when you're in church. You don't have a chance to preach to them. You know, it's very rare that you have the opportunity to share your faith with your workmates and so on. You know, it happens once in a while, but the thing that they see all the time is your family. They hear you, you know, talk to your wife. I love you, babe. Okay, I'll be home. Yeah, get the kids ready. We're going to go to the thing. But, you know, they, they witness what your family is like. They hear you complaining about your husband or your wife or whatever. That's your Christian witness. That's the thing that establishes the credibility of your faith with them. Because in their minds they're thinking, well, if this guy can't even take care of his own family, pff, he's got nothing to teach me about religion, right? So Paul says that an orderly family requires three main components. You can't have it without these. Number one, a submissive wife begins with the woman because she is the key to a balanced Christian home. Yeah, I know that sounds old fashioned and you know, but it is so true. The wife is the key, she's the heart. A woman who respects and supports her husband's leadership despite his flaws and hers as well. This is the first component in an orderly family. Why do I say that? Because Paul begins with the wife. You know, let's face it. Okay, so the leadership is supposed to be, you know, moral spiritual leadership, supposed to be with the husband, right? Why didn't he start with the husband? What did he say? Well, okay, here's the ordered family. Number one, let's start with the, the head, you know, the man. He doesn't start with him. He starts with the important element first, the woman. She's the heart. Then a loving husband, a man who understands and accepts and practices loving leadership of his wife and children is the second part of the equation. Now a lot of people ask, well, if my husband won't lead, what is a Christian woman to do? My answer, well then don't you lead him because that's not your job. The job is left vacant. So what do I do, says the woman? I tell them, lead your children. Lead your children. Did you not hear about Timothy, whose father was a Greek? Who taught him how to be a Christian? Who taught him obedience? Who taught him about spiritual life? From an early age you have known the holy writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, uh, 15. Who gave him that? Well, his mother gave him that and his grandmother gave him that. Your job's not to lead your husband if your husband won't lead. Your job then is to lead your children. And then of course the third element, obedient children. Ordered families suffer their greatest strains when children begin to test the limits of parental authority. Paul says it is possible to do this without discouraging the children. I used to compare it to rope. I used to compare it with our children, how much rope I give you. you know, there's just so much rope. And I used to assure them, my goal is to give you all the rope eventually. That's my role. My goal is to make sure that you are free of my authority and you fly on your own. But in the meantime, I'm holding the rope. I'm letting it go slowly. And the speed at which I release the rope is dependent upon your obedience to me. The more you obey, the more rope I give you. 
So we'll go back to Emily. Why was it that Emily at 15 and a half had her own car, had a job, worked after school? Why? Because she was an obedient child. I gave her a lot of rope. And as parents, we know you, it, it isn't the same rule for every child. Some children you have to hold on, right? You have to hold on, it's like a wild bull, you know? You have to hold the rope. So we've learned that consistency and fairness and tenderness, this goes a long way in repairing and maintaining the bonds with children at this time. Because there are times in a relationship with a child, the only thing that works, the only thing you can do is just hug them. I love you. We don't agree here. I'm sad this thing has happened. But you're my daughter. You're my son. I love you. I will always love you. We'll talk about it tomorrow. All right. So that's our lesson for today. We keep going. We have two lessons left in this series. Thank you for your attention.